Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the MCC webinar series. My name is Jamal Bakhti, and I'll be your moderator for this evening. I'm currently in my final year as an undergrad at DePaul University, and I'm actively a part of the MSA at DePaul University, known as the Paul Umma, and I've been extremely active with the youth of MCC. Currently, I work on MCC projects such as the Big Brother program and the Unfiltered podcast that we just started up during Ramadan. That being said, thank you for joining us for our seventh virtual Ramadan lecture. Tonight's topic is Zakat and Faith-Based Philanthropy for Muslims, with the co-founder and COO of LaunchGood, Amani Kalawi, and Muslim Community Center Welfare and Rehab Committee Chair, Amal Mahsin. Our previous six webinars can be found on the MEC Masjid YouTube channel, as well as the MCC Interfaith and Outreach Facebook page. Before beginning, we want to give a big thank you to all the essential workers that are placing themselves in harm's way to make sure the country stays running during this crisis. If you've been tuning in weekly, I'm sure you've heard the history of MCC outlined multiple times. Today, I want to dive a little deeper into a program that I'm personally involved in at MCC. With Youth of MCC, I partake in the Big Brother program. This program is designed to mentor middle school boys in their transition to high school. During an evening weekly, we spend time with the boys, planning new activities, and also having small Islamic discussions. Alhamdulillah, it's been a blessing for me to be a part of this program and many others at MCC. As you know, the doors of MCC are closed and Ramadan is our biggest time to raise funds. Through your generosity and as an obligation of zakat and charitable giving, we ask that you please continue to donate using the link in the chat to keep programs like this and the Big Brother program running. We understand that many nonprofits are struggling and whatever you're able to give today or in the future will be greatly appreciated. Thank you in advance for your generosity. We know that if you can't give now, you will give in the future. Civic engagement is very important at MCC. We as an organization actively work to have our voices heard in places that help all of humanity. Making sure we vote and fill out our census is instrumental in that role. I know my family has completed their census and it only took about five minutes. Now, Fatima Siddiqa, a fellow from the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, a MCC Academy graduate, and an actively engaged member of MCC, will speak on census education. Thanks, Jamal. So first, I want to begin by um, introducing the census and what exactly it is. So what is the census? It's just a survey of everyone living in the United States, and it happens every 20 years, and the federal government is mandated to do it. It's very simple. It's just nine questions. What's your name, your sex, where are the people living in your house? What's your date of birth? And for the first time ever, it can be done online. There are two things that come out of the census. Um, the, the first thing is $700 billion in federal resources for things like infrastructure, for our uh, financial aid, if you go to school, for your financial aid, um, for our libraries, public resources that everybody uses. And the second thing we get is congressional representation. And right now, Illinois has a about uh, 18, has 18 representatives in the U.S. House. And if we have an under account, we could be losing another one. So back in early March, you should have received a letter like the one on the left with your household's unique ID, but you don't need it to fill it out. You could just use your address. So you can go online to my2020census.gov and complete it, or you can call on the phone and you have language assistance available, or you can mail back your uh, paper questionnaire, which is very rare for people to receive one. But if you do, that is a possibility. That's an option. So these are some of the stories from people in our communities and why they want to be counted. This is something for everybody. You don't have to be a registered uh, voter. You don't have to be a citizen. You can be undocumented. You can be of any age. It's for everybody to fill it out. So if you do need help, you can go uh, to this number, our hotline, and um, you can call and just say that you want some help filling out your census, or if you have some other kind of need, um, you can call the Care Coalition, say you need food assistance, or you need um, mental health support, anything, and we'll be there to help you. So please call us if you need any help with your census. Thank you, Fatima. Um, Alhamdulillah, tonight we have some great guests on the panel to discuss our topic. Um, Amani Gilloui is the co-founder and COO of LaunchGood.com, a niche-based global crowdfund crowdfunding platform supporting Muslims launching good all over the world by helping them raise funds for their projects, campaigns, and creative ideas. She is a graduate of the School of Social Work at Wayne State University and founding member of the Detroit Minds and Hearts Fellowship, a social incubator 
where she works with inner city Muslim youth to help them develop and launch their own community initiatives for social justice. As a social worker turned social entrepreneur, she brings in an interesting mix of experience through her work and community. Also, we have Amal Mohsen. Amal Mohsen has been volunteering with MCC for almost five years. She became chair of the Rehab and Welfare Committee in 2019 after three years of volunteering. Amal also serves as a secretary to the board for MCC. Professionally, she does regulatory project management and is currently working with the Department of Health. Inshallah, we'll be kicking the program off with Amani Kilawi, transition to Amal Mohsen, and then follow up with discussion and Q&A. You can submit questions via the Q&A bar below. If you have any technical difficulties, please contact us under the chat box and we'll do our best to assist you. Without further ado, I welcome Amani. Awesome, thank you so much, Amani. You can, everyone can hear me well, yeah? And hopefully see me. Okay, awesome, I am just gonna share my screen. And here we go. And everyone hopefully is able to see this great. Um, all right, Bismillah. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to MMCC's uh, annual interfaith uh, dinner. Every year I've been able to attend so far. This is my second year, and uh, of course, virtually uh, puts a whole different twist on it. So, Alhamdulillah, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to talk a little bit about. Uh, how we are seeing giving happening worldwide and specifically within the American Mus Muslim community, but also uh, a little bit more about our work, right, in terms of how do you do giving now? How does COVID affect everything and what does that look like? So before I get started, I want to talk a little bit about uh, LaunchGood itself. Uh, now, uh, we are the world's largest crowdfunding platform built for Muslims. And the way I like to frame it is kind of like a Muslim GoFundMe or Kickstarter. So if you've never heard of uh, crowdfunding, you've never heard of uh, LaunchGood, if you've heard of GoFundMe, it's essentially the same concept, but uniquely built for the global Muslim community. And the story starts uh, back in 2015. So as Jamal mentioned, I used to be a youth organizer and I would often crowdfund to support the projects I was working on. I didn't really understand the grant system and I didn't have, uh, you know, a family friend that I can ask for a large sums of money. And so I would crowdfund. And as I started to crowdfund, I realized something incredible and in that crowdfunding is an amazing way to tell stories and it's an amazing way to rally a community together, right? To really be able to uh, garner support about your project. And so uh, I didn't at the time though connect that crowdfunding could be something that I could bring back to my community. It was just something I was doing. It's not till two years after that that I met my co-founder Chris and Omar and we realized something. We realized that there's 1.6 billion Muslims, there's over 400 crowdfunding websites, but none yet uniquely built for the Muslim community. And so we said, you know what, it's about time we built a platform for the Muslim community that tells our stories and at the same time inspires Muslims to do good so that every campaign on the site becomes a chapter in this global storybook of who we are as a community. And so we really wanted to build LaunchGood as a way to change the narrative of Muslims being a problem to society. Instead, we wanted to show a narrative of Muslims being an incredible asset to the community, Muslims doing good worldwide, Muslims doing good uh, locally and internationally. And LaunchGood was started uh, with that in mind. And uh, to date, we've helped raise over 100 million worldwide for uh, 11,000 campaigns impacting 137 countries and about uh, uh, over half a million users. And you know, it, it hasn't been easy, but uh, it's really been amazing to see the support happen all over the world. And I, I want to showcase here, uh, this is our $100 uh, million page. So when we hit $100 million in funds raised, uh, we launched a little celebratory video. And I, I want to show this video because I think it showcases a really good understanding of the type of work that American Muslims and Muslims worldwide are part of. So I'll play that right here. Alhamdulillah, with your help, we've now raised $100 million in donations. Thank you. We couldn't have done this without you. From our humble beginnings in 2013, LaunchGit has been a place to support Oops. I think it's going to take a minute to load. Great ideas in the community. 
and to challenge ourselves to think bigger. Together, we've denounced hate and responded with love. We've helped elevate culture and challenge the narrative to show the world who Muslims really are. And what great things we're capable of doing. We truly believe in the power of the global Ummah, connected no matter where we are, with an intention to do good and create positive change and to build an inspired future. It's been an amazing journey so far, seeing the impact, and I invite you to be part of our next milestone, one billion rupees, inshallah. It's always uh, weird to see yourself speaking. Uh, all right, now, what kind of projects have we seen? I want to I want to showcase just a few. Uh, you know, when we first started, uh, we wanted to focus on creative efforts, and then quickly realized that actually charity really hits home within the Muslim community. Uh, we needed money to get our project started. We actually were terrible at fundraising for our own efforts. Uh, but eventually ended up sort of bootstrapping the website, uh, launching it with just $10,000 uh, and taking it from there to over 100 million raised. And, and it wasn't easy, but what was so incredible, what kept us going was the amount of amazing projects all across the board. And one of our first viral campaigns was actually one, I remember this campaign back in 2015 when Muslims raised funds for black churches that were burned down in the South. And it was a really beautiful campaign. It was called Rebuild with Love. Uh, and the idea here was that no one was really talking about what's happening. Uh, There's a lot of arson or string cases of arson within the uh, within churches in the South. And so, uh, a community member from uh, from the Muslim community, Fatma Knight, decided to do something. And so she initially just sent flowers to these churches, and then decided, you know what? What if we could raise a small amount, even if it was just ten thousand dollars? But symbolically, it sent a strong message to everyone. And that campaign ended up raising a hundred thousand, and it was our first viral campaign. And you see this as well in that uh, the giving within the Muslim community is is quite expansive. It's not just unique to Muslims; it's any cause that our faith really calls us uh, to 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 take the reins and and support. And the other. Uh, story I want to showcase is uh, when we raised funds for Jewish cemeteries. And this was a really interesting one because as soon as this campaign was tweeted by J.K. Rowling, all five backup servers on our site completely crashed. And it was a really incredible time because she had brought in so much traffic. But again, it was a beautiful effort of Muslims stepping up and saying, you know what, we want to uh, show that we uh, are here, we hear you, we see you, uh, and this is unacceptable. We want to support the efforts that you were part of. So, couple those are a couple examples uh, that uh, I like to share initially uh, because they really showcase this idea that uh, giving doesn't just have to happen within the Muslim community, but it, it's expansive. Now, if you're still new to crowdfunding, it, it's quite uh, it's quite broad. Uh, a couple other projects that are local here that we've seen Muslims give to is believers bail out. So using your zakat to bail out uh, Muslims who are uh, incarcerated, uh, helping with special education needs, uh, making masajid or mosque more accessible, and even projects like uh, the world's first Hajj backpack. Muslims have been on a pilgrimage for 1400 years to Mecca, but yet there hasn't been any new or fun ways to uh, really uh, handle or, or enjoy Hajj in a way that makes it a little bit easier. And a few other projects here as well. Now, obviously we're in uh, Ramadan right now and it's an incredibly uh, amazing time to fundraise. It's an incredibly amazing time to uh, be spiritually recharged. And we know that majority of operating funds are raised for uh, communities in Ramadan. And we're seeing that with COVID, that it's really caused uh, a major threat to our mosques, our nonprofits, our schools. And we know that typically the fundraising uh, within these communities, within our, our, our masjid communities, tends to be uh, at the masjid and at prayers. And when people can't go to the masjid, it's had a huge impact uh, for uh, the Muslim community. And so what we've found uh, the Muslim community respond to is, is two ways. One, we're seeing all sorts of smaller campaigns to help uh, Masajid uh, raise operational funds during uh, COVID, but also uh, uh, 
the Penny Appeal team that we've worked with has not only focused on raising funds for local efforts, but launched a campaign focused on financial hardship grants. And it's, it's incredible because although the Muslim community is hitting really hard with what's happening, they themselves also led a half a million dollar campaign to support uh, any individual does not have to be Muslim with uh, financial hardship grants. And in fact, uh, the, both these campaigns are not active. They, they've already completed. These were so successful that uh, they actually had to stop the grant application because they ran out of uh, grants to give. But you see the impact, of course, of COVID, both within the Muslim community and, of course, uh, outside the Muslim community, within our own rallying to support imams and mosques that are now impacted by COVID, and of course, uh, supporting those outside the community with hardship grants. In fact, uh, so far today, uh, at least what, that I'm aware of uh, through our platform, over two million has been raised for Corona relief efforts, with the single largest campaign being 400,000 with Penny uh, Appeal USA. And again, it showcases that generosity of the Muslim community. Now, I don't know if we'll have time to get into specific insights within the American Muslim community, but one thing that uh, I do uh, want to share uh, that uh, time and time again is true is that religion does motivate giving for the Muslim community. And we see this uh, through all of these efforts on launch good, but also that poverty, domestic poverty matters a lot to Muslims. And, and we see this with the COVID Penny Appeal USA campaign. It's really incredible to see that type of effort rallied uh, across so many different uh, organizations uh, supporting, you know, two million raised might not seem like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, it, it really means a lot for the average individual organization that is receiving uh, a piece of those funds. Now, uh, the other thing that we're noticing with uh, COVID is uh, because of the challenge with what's happening, we've stepped up to support a lot of organizations and also, one of the things that we try to do to make giving fun is how could we support these campaigns and these institutions, especially during this time of COVID, right? It's quite sensitive. Uh, a lot of support is needed. And so we launched our annual giving challenge where you can find any campaign you want, add it to a give list and support it uh, through our Ramadan challenge. And again, we give all the time as a Muslim community, but how do we make giving fun? And so we launched the annual Ramadan challenge uh, where uh, to date we've had over 15,000 people collectively give 2 million to various causes. And this means so much for these organizations and institutions that are impacted by COVID right now. Uh, you know, the average donation is just $10, but when you have 15,000 people coming together to give that $10, it, it really goes a long way. In fact, I want to show you a quick video of uh, our Ramadan challenge uh, and how uh, it looks today. I don't believe I have my sound on, so I might have to share again. That's okay. I think you can see it from here. Uh, now, uh, Evan will probably get into zakat in just a minute, uh, but part of this is also allowing Muslims to fulfill their zakat. One of the things that uh, we'll probably be talking about more in depth is zakat, and zakat is 2.5% of of our wealth. Uh, so Muslims have to give uh, a way to purify their wealth. They have to give 2.5 percent of uh, their their wealth. And how wealth is defined is uh, depends on uh, sort of the school of thought you follow. But uh, uh, we did launch as a cat page, a launchgood.com slash the cat that makes it easy for anyone to find a cool cause to support uh, that is verified by a scholar. Now it, it's a uh, uh, it's it's really interesting to see the, the value of zakat in the sense that it's been something that we have done for 1,400 years. But again, it's hard to find causes uh, unless you have MMCC that is uh, sharing uh, uh, efforts within your community. Uh, you have to actually go out and find specific initiatives to give to. And so that was our effort to, uh, inshallah, make that uh, a little bit easier. I think I am due on time. Uh, but I'll let Jamal. Um, if you had anything more to share, you could go ahead and share. No, I think I'm good there. I want to leave uh, more for the Q&A in terms of folks' curiosity. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Amani. Um, now we're going to move on to Ahmed Mohsin. 
Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And so just to piggyback off of what Amani was saying, uh, in Islam, the poor have a right uh, over the rich through charity. And, and that is that 2.5% of, of individual savings. Now, the wisdom of zakat, as you know, from the sense of the people is to purify their souls. The wisdom of zakat from the perspective of the community is of, of the society is to enable the poor to be financially independent. As Muslims, we know that we must relieve those in poverty uh, as our primary focus in life. Now, at MCC, we have a proud history of the distribution of zakat, fitra, and sadaqa. Now, currently, there are five big ways that we're impacting the Chicagoland community here at MCC. Now, the, just to name a few, uh, now going into the just a little bit of the background, in the last five years, as many of you know, there has been a lot of influx of refugees from Syria, Burma, and the Central, um, Central Africa as well. Now, with those refugees brought in a whole new perspective from the Zakat Committee, because we weren't used to actually uh, dealing with war-torn countries, and we were mostly dealing with in very local entities that uh, were having uh, issues. But today, from the last five years uh, as, a, uh, as a perspective, is 37% of our groups are, are Syrian, and 10% are American, 15% are Burmese, and then the rest of our percentages uh, go through other minor groups. So. As you can see, the majority of our uh, groups have become uh, our new generation that has entered America and decided to uh, definitely pursue a life that, that you know, a, away from their home country. Now, it, putting it in a perspective that when we came to America, when our grandparents came to America, when our parents came to America, essentially majority of us came with a plan. Now, these individuals did not obviously anticipate leaving their country and they did not anticipate leaving their personal wealth, their homes behind. Now, what we have tried to do is the best way to describe it is assimilation into the Muslim community uh, and especially at MCC. When we took on the refugee groups, um, starting with Syria, we understood that there was going to be many learning experiences. And we definitely learned a lot and we are still learning and growing today. Now, many came over in general, not uh, for free. They came over with agencies that they took out loans with. And that was a huge uh, thing for them to overcome, the fact that they were already coming to America with debt. So what we did uh, in the Zakat Committee, we decided that, that we were going to be a complete expansive group and going full force on tackling the issues that they were facing every day. Now, our volunteer staff has been amazing. It's grown a lot the last five years. And Alhamdulillah, starting with Project Rizq, who has uh, really encompassed the, the, the giving in our group, and they make our food boxes, 150 food boxes every month. They distribute and co collect uh, our, our uh, uh, school su school supplies, and then they also um, do community dinners as well as gifts for the parents and toys during uh, for kids during Eid, and they have been our shining star at, at at the rehab and welfare committee. Now, with as the COVID crisis went on, we knew that obviously we couldn't do things through the masjid as normal. So what we decided to do was uh, go online for all work for Zakat. So essentially what we also did was we took on Iflad. We understood that a lot of families in the area depended on MCC to give Iftar for the month. So we went out to the community and everyone came back with such a warm heart and donated to our cause. So now we also have a group that is every night selflessly uh, dedicating their time after work during their fasting and driving all around Chicago and distributing iftar. By the end of this month, we would have we would we will distribute close to six thousand meals in the Chicago land area. 
So Alhamdulillah, our volunteer force has been amazing on iftar, and then inshallah soon we will be donating and, and mailing out all of the toys that the, to that the kids would have enjoyed in-house at MCC. Now, on the other perspective is the donations of Zakat. So our internal, uh, our internal team that processes our, our, our Zakat applications through an internal database that we've been able to house all of our applicants' histories are working full time and overtime to process over 300 applications just this month, just the last two weeks, actually. Now, this is essentially for the month of, uh, for Zakat as well as Fitra. Now, inshallah, we'll be able to finish the month out with over $45,000 in financial aid that's distributed just from MCC. On the perspective of the food distribution, that will cross 40,000 as well. So Alhamdulillah, and since the COVID crisis, we would have distributed close to $85,000 in financial aid. So this is from March. So Alhamdulillah, we've been able to take your donations and take your, your help and redirect it back into the community. Now, in regards to uh, our third point, so our volunteer staff has been amazing. The, the capabilities of MCC coming into the, to on its own through COVID has been amazing, not just with the distribution of zakat, but with making sure that our sadaqa is ready and, and uh, for all that, that need it as well because we not only distribute to Muslims, we distribute to non-Muslims in the area that are, are reeling from the COVID crisis as well as even before the COVID crisis. So 10% of our uh, individuals that come in are not Muslim. So it's definitely something that we pride ourselves in that we are, open door, we are an open door to all communities. Now, the, this would not have been obviously possible with our, without our leaders. The MCC leadership in the last 50 years has always recognized zakat and sadaqa distribution as the, the primary, primary uh, aspect of MCC. And without our community re behind us in, in these donations, our COVID response would not have been what it is today. Uh, a month ago, I was told that if thought is definitely not possible, but now today we are feeding families every single night. So our community has rallied behind us uh, at the Rehab and Welfare Committee. And Alhamdulillah, we have been able to really come in to our own and, and inshallah expand as the months continue because we know that COVID itself will continue. Now the partnerships we've been able to uh, really come into as well, not just with the COVID crisis, but before that, is to align our, our vision with not just providing financial aid for our recipients, it's more of putting them on a trajectory of actually coming to a position where they can, where they can maintain themselves. One, the one thing that they told me when you, when you interview someone that is, that is applying for Zakat is they always tell you that they don't want to be here. And we understand that. No one wants to come in and say that they could not provide for their family, they could not put their kids through school, or if they want to put their school, their kids through Islamic school, they don't want to come in and say, you know, I can't afford it, but I want my kids to, to grow up in an Islamic environment. Now, what they came to me as well is that what MCC has done for them is the fact that uh, they were, they came in and we, we welcomed them with open arms. And then as the time as time progressed, they saw MCC as their main masjid, and then over time, they brought in their children to the masjid, and then now they're enrolling themselves, enrolling their their kids into the weekend program, and it, eventually, it it the next generation will take over, and and alhamdulillah, you know they would come in as as we came in as immigrants, they came in as refugees, and suddenly now they are the the, the leaders of the community in, in 20, 30, 40 years, their, their kids and their grandkids will take over. And that's the kind of spirit, the kind of, the, the kind of environment that we want to create is that you came 
here on a, 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 rough, a rough pathway. But MCC provided you a, a not, not just a, a place to pray, but a home to call, a home to, to, to live with, to, sorry, a home to, to settle in and to make sure that your kids get the right education and you are able to guide your family in the right direction. And alhamdulillah, our volunteers, some of them today are actual Zakat recipients that wanted to give back to MCC. So we have many levels of our volunteers, uh, our volunteers that are the uh, musallis in the community that have helped us with uh, not only the distribution of all of that we've been able to give, but the Zakat recipients themselves have come back to MCC and said that they want to help the people that help them. So MCC itself is the home to many, many, many ethnic groups and many uh, ways of life. But ultimately, we are here to take care of the community and we're going to do this through COVID and until, uh, until this is over and beyond. Thank you so much, Ahmed. That was extremely powerful. Um, MCC does do a lot, and the Zakat and Welfare Committee, or Wealth and Welfare Committee, does a lot as well. So we want to thank you guys so much for that. Um, now, Amel and Amani, Amani, thank you so much for sharing about Launch Good as well. The presentation was fabulous, and I love the video. Um, we also want to take a moment and thank Babina, our ASL interpreter, for doing such a great job here today with us as well. Um, if you guys have any questions so far, please do leave it in the chat or in the Q and A box below, so we can get to it as we are gonna now transition into a Q&A segment. Um, some questions that I have for our panelists today, um, and either of you guys can answer it first, doesn't matter. Uh, but the first one that I have is, what are some resources on Muslim philanthropy that you would recommend? So I can start first. Uh, I definitely recommend the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Uh, I shared a, a quick sort of infographic of their work on philanthropy. Uh, I also recommend anything by uh, Sharik Siddiqui. You can just uh, Google Sharik Siddiqui, Lilly School of Philanthropy. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't that much yet around the space. I mean, we're, we're just starting to uh, put together the research that's needed to better understand the Muslim community's specific giving habits. Uh, but it's exciting to see some effort and some research uh, within the space. But uh, it's not, I would say, as ex extensive and expansive as it could be because in and itself it's just a fascinating uh, area of study uh, and uh, there's a lot of space to go deeper. Definitely. Awesome. Um, any resources for you that you use? Our main resource honestly for the Zakat community is Sheikh Ibrahim at MCC. So we do lean on him for a lot of our questions as well as the leadership team. So uh, obviously the distribution of zakat is very sensitive. So we want to make sure that we are following the religious guidelines. So having our imam there to make sure that uh, we are distributing funds in a religious manner that is approved is cornerstone to our program, uh, as well as the, the, obviously the board is very involved as well as the executive team and the religious affairs leadership. Definitely, alhamdulillah. Yeah, I think definitely looking around for guidance for people that are a lot more knowledgeable around you is a great resource, as well as the books. Um, everything's great, alhamdulillah. Um, so next question I have for you two are, um, what are some misconceptions about Muslim giving that the average American is not aware of? Uh, I could kick it off and say, well, when I think about that question, um, I think the number one misconception would be that Muslims only give to causes within their own uh, backyard or within their own community or only to Muslims. And, uh, you know, we saw from the ISP research that a significant portion of Muslim giving is not actually uh, necessarily, the recipients don't necessarily have to be Muslims, but the impact could be above and beyond. Uh, and, and we've seen that in our case with a lot of campaigns as well, where, uh, for example, the COVID relief campaign, that was half a million, almost half a million dollars in uh, in relief fund that uh, didn't necessarily have any uh, identity mark on it. You didn't have to be Muslim to receive those financial grants. So that's, that's the first piece is that uh, uh, many people assuming potentially that uh, Muslims uh, are only giving within a certain uh, area or certain specific focus area. And then two, 
realizing that actually Muslims give beyond that area, whatever that might be, whether it's masajid or mosque, but also uh, for efforts outside the Muslim community. A second misconception I would also say is, uh, I don't know if it's a misconception as much as people don't quite know how generous Muslims are. Uh, so when you look at uh, when you when you take a crowdfunding website like Just Giving in the UK, and when they looked at their uh, donors, they found that uh, the most generous group of the donors that they had identified with the faith tradition were Muslims, giving about five hundred dollars uh, on average a year. Uh, and so, again, not realizing the generosity uh, and how much uh, that plays a really big role uh, into everything we do. In fact, there's something that we you might have heard maybe scholars say this, but that the zakat, the 2.5% that we pay on, 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 on wealth is like the charity of the miserly, right? That's kind of like just covering your basis. That 2.5% is what you should be doing anyways. And then beyond that is, is really where, what you should be aiming for. That's definitely powerful. Um, when I was actually working with the MCC, uh, the Saranti or Sarakada, she was leading this effort, the grocery runs. Um, for people in Chicagoland during COVID. Um, and we were helping out people that weren't even Muslim either. It was anyone that needed help or they were elderly or had a disability that needed groceries or needed food. Um, so that was great to be a part of. So that definitely goes at that misconception that you outlined. Amal, do you have any thoughts? Just really to echo those statements, honestly, I've met people that didn't think that Muslims donated at all. And, and volunteered at all. I I went to places and volunteered. They're like, you're the first Muslim I've seen volunteer. And that was kind of shocking to me because I obviously have been with MCC for the last five years, but a lot of them are not, they're, they're, the misconception is that we're not coming out of our community. And that's something obviously that, you know, we wanna make sure that we are marketing ourselves and we are doing and we are donating outside of our community and reaching out to those that are, helping, um, you know, our needy. And one of the things that, M that Rehab and Welfare did was partner with non-Muslim centers um, like the Albany Park Community Center uh, to make sure that we're partnering with other groups that can, can take on the, the needs of MCC that we can't take on. So it's something that, you know, obviously Muslims probably really need to do better as far as marketing ourselves and, and telling the people that we're actually doing this. I think a lot of us just do it under a cloud and, and no one knows that we're doing it, but Muslims are really out there and on the forefront. And we just need to make sure that you know, uh, people understand that this is our main goal and our religion to do this. Definitely. Um, it was really interesting, Amani, how you outlined how one of the fundraisers was for Muslim fundraising for Jewish cemeteries. Um, I, I currently go to the Paul University and I'm part of the MSR, or known as Umma there. And we actually, our room next door to our, our, um, our room is the Jewish Life Center. And we actually end up working with them a lot more than any other groups on campus, surprisingly, as another religious organization. Um, and we help out at their events, they help out at our events. And it's been a whole friendly relation. Even though we may not have the same exact same faith beliefs, uh, we still show up for each other, which is great. And yeah, I think that misconception is highlighted in almost all communities too, uh, being able to help out each other. And Muslims definitely do that, especially here at MCC and Launch Good. Right. And the challenge, I think, is just those stories aren't being told enough, right? Um, uh, you know, it, there's so much negative narr narrative about Muslims that uh, it's almost like you have to work triple overtime to, to uh, debunk that narrative. Um, and so that, of course, makes it harder uh, because uh, sometimes good stories, unless they're super sensationalized, aren't exciting to, to share as much as bad news is. And so, you know, all of us doing incredible work in the trenches and within our community, uh, it makes it sometimes difficult uh, in that the work is for sure happening. It's just a matter of how much of that is a, is a getting visibility uh, globally or internationally or even within our local uh, news cycles. Definitely, great. Um, we do have a question that just came in um, and here, here's the question I got read out loud and whoever feels inclined to answer, please go ahead. Um, do the organizations have targeted impacts, focus areas or demographics when, the, the, when dispersing zakat or is it a question of first come first serve? Would having targeted distributions with intended outcomes be a good way to distribute zakat? I can take this one. So when we, uh, our platform is built on, it's not a first come first serve. It's really the, so if every month we have a certain budget of zakat that we're able to utilize for that particular month. 
So anyone and anyone can come in and apply for the, the Zakat application. Now we take a look at everyone equally and to see who is in the greater need. So our focus um, is at the elderly stage. So the elderly, the widows, and there are a lot of widows that came through from, the, um, from Burma, from Syria that we focused on early on just to get them on their feet and, and, and working part-time, full-time, whatever they can help their, their, their kids. And then we went through the, uh, to the, the disabled. Those that we know that potentially can't get government aid because they are new to the system. Uh, and so forth. So the, the biggest groups are that we focus on is the, the widows, the elderly, and the disabled. And then from then on, we start taking a look at if, you know, if you are working part-time but just can't make uh, rent for that month and so forth. So we, we evaluate every single application thoroughly, depending on what we have left of our budget and distribute accordingly. So it's not a first come, first serve. If that was the case, I know a couple of people that are first of every month that they, that they are there, but you know it, it's really holding on to 300 applications and evaluating them at all the same time and making sure that you're giving everyone an opportunity to show that they are in need. I have a question for Emil, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. All right, perfect. So Emil, it's really interesting um, that uh, you know MCC decided to take on sort of the. Um, responsibility, or you can call it the collective responsibility of, of taking care of Zakat. Um, you know, is that, how can other mosques adopt that model? Because for example, you know, it's time for me to give my Zakat. I like to give it on the 27th night of Ramadan. And um, uh, I have to go and find causes, but a lot of Zakat is supporting what's in your own backyard, right? You're supporting those in your own community. And so if my local masjid had an effort that made it easy, I think that'd be, uh, it, it would make me feel comfortable knowing that my donation is going to people right here in my community that need it, right, first and foremost. So is it a program that's easy for other mosques to adopt? I mean, 300 applications reviewing that is, is quite extensive. Um, and then what was the thought process behind saying, you know what, we want to take on this collective responsibility versus giving it to maybe a relief or humanitarian organization? You know, alhamdulillah, MCC has a strong history of giving zakat way before our group came on board. So they had already a foundation laid out. When our kind of younger group came on, we were more of let's make this faster, let's make this electronic, and let's make a database versus going from paper to paper and then losing papers and so forth. So we were able to house all of the applications in-house in MCC in our database to make sure that we are following each case. Now, the, 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 the greatest part of this is that we're able to see someone go from, I'm in need of Zagat, I'm new to this country, and then following their kind of electronic timeline of now that, you know, now they have a full-time job, they barely need Zagat, and, you know, they're so grateful to MCC. And helping the Chicagoland area, Zagat has, MCC Zagat, we've distributed for 2019, um, close to I think it was three to three hundred fifty thousand dollars just to communities in the Chicagoland area, mm -hmm. and then an additional two hundred fifty thousand in organizations like ICNA Relief and other and other like communities that were helping not just Muslims but obviously non-Muslims, um, you know, overcome what they were overcoming at that point. So we we focused on Chicagoland because um, unlike other communities, Chicagoland is very large and it has many neighborhoods that you know you know you and i will never see yeah. but we, we were able to really get get into the the these neighborhoods and pull out these muslims and and say you know if you guys need help and and we went through burmese translators to the rohingya center to to the siri network to everyone to make sure that we're grabbing everyone and we're not and, the, and no one is getting you know out of our vision so mm -hmm. It's really, it's the idea that the, the MCC has tried to reach out to the community and it's paid off because we're able to reach a lot more people than we were able to reach five years ago. That's amazing. That's great, subhanAllah. Um, Amani, a question for you for, for, uh, for Launch Good. Would donating to a Launch Good cause, would that qualify as a gather or no? 
Okay, so that depends. Uh, so we have two sort of levels on the platform. Uh, we let people mark their campaign as Zakat uh, because uh, a lot of organizations uh, within their own sort of understanding and interpretation of uh, Islamic rules uh, may see themselves as Zakat. Others may not see it as Zakat. So we allow them to uh, qualify or sorry, really mark their campaign as Zakat eligible. And then we allow donors to mark their donations as Zakat. And again, that's going to be self-interpreted, right? Uh, based on my school of thought or your school of thought, you may consider something Zakat eligible and, and it might not be uh, to another individual. So there's that layer. But then uh, for Namadlan, we do do something special where we set up a page, launchgrid.com slash Zakat, where we say, you know what, these campaigns are extra verified by uh, Imam Joe Bradford, who is a Zakat expert and has shared a lot of great content and resources around that. And that's where we're comfortable saying, well, this is based on this understanding. And so if you're looking for something that is more specific, you know, a lot of your average Muslim may not have uh, all the nuances around Zakat understood quite well. And so sometimes they just want to go to a scholar, someone who can say, you know what, you know, as in the case with MMCC, just to be able to understand, okay, what is it that I can support? And that's where we have that opportunity to say, okay, if you want another level of verification that's not just um, self-determined by the organization or individual, check out uh, these uh, campaigns here uh, to be able to support any of them. And kind of going back to what you said, Emmett, about making it you know, electronic, making it fun, making it gamified, uh, and also doing it in a way that dignifies uh, the uh, campaigns. You can mark it, you can mark your donation as anonymous. Mm -hmm. uh, you can support a lot of efforts. Of course, I'm still, you know, even though there's launch good, I'm still biased of the approach of going towards my own metric community uh, and uh, being able to make sure that you're supporting individuals that are really struggling and trying to make ends meet. Uh, but that's that's just my my uh, understanding, not necessarily, I should have a disclaimer, not, not launch good or any scholar uh, um, opinion. Uh, but that's one way that we've been able to balance that as a platform. Definitely, yeah, that actually helps out a lot. Um, a question that we had, probably targeted towards you, Ahmed, um, is someone would like to know how much the cat we distribute versus we collect? It really depends on the time of the year, right? Mm -hmm. So the biggest amount comes obviously during the month of Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, we're, I think it's about like 250,000 does come through Ramadan. Then what the Zakat committee has to do is sit down with our treasurer and, and really budget out month to month to make sure that we don't run out. Have we run, run out before? We have. And that was a very nervous time. So we want to make sure that it lasts the entire year because you will get situations like COVID that will come in and, and, and definitely ruin a lot of things. And suddenly the, the gas doesn't come in every month. So when it comes through during Ramadan, at that point, we sit down as a committee and we plan out the entire year to make sure that it's good for 12 months the following Ramadan because we can't anticipate you know, what will happen um, during the course of that year. So uh, about, I can't say because I'm not the treasurer, but I, I want to say it's about 250 that comes in and definitely the majority of that goes out. But Alhamdulillah, the community does try to replenish throughout the year, but um, we do budget out accordingly every month. That makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you for answering that. Um, awesome. So we'll hop into our last question that we have for the question that I had for you guys. And if any more Q&A questions come in, uh, we'll go ahead and answer those. But can you each share a story that best highlights the impact of your work, uh, whether it's you, Ahmed, with MCC or Amani with LaunchGood? You want to go first, Ahmed? I'm, I, am, I am still thinking there's too many stories. You're right. There's a lot of stories, um, but I, I would say, honestly, and going back to my earlier comment, is that we had Zakat applicants that turned around and, and became full, like, volunteers at MCC, and not just volunteered with Zakat, but they volunteered with all of the uh, different programs that came around with special events and so forth, and, and eat at the park uh, that we did last year, and inshallah, we'll be able to do again in the near future. Um, they the fact that we were able to grab people that that came from you know such a a past that we may never see and 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 they turned into something that's so positive 
that they said MCC is our home and we will dedicate our time because they dedicated their time to us. It was it's something that like I can't, there's no replacing that. And these, these folks will be our friends forever, our, our brothers, our sisters. So Alhamdulillah, with this program, I have been able to meet so many new faces that are going to be the new faces of MCC and their children will be the children of MCC. And inshallah, you know, they'll grow from there. And it's really, and, and, I, and I really emphasize that the people that you impact will come back and, and you will be rewarded. And that is the best thing that can come out of this. Yeah. You know, along those lines, I have one and a half stories to share is, is one, one way to put it. Um, you know, you know, regardless of what you believe, in, even if, uh, you know, you may not believe in um, uh, an afterlife or, or whatnot, um, the concept of good karma or that, you know, doing good things will come back and, and uh, serve you well is, I found it true to be very true in our work. And I'll give you one example. Um, we were going through a specific challenge as a platform and um, we needed to be in touch with certain individuals within the payment space. And uh, the, the, this specific individual was, uh, you know, someone that we would have never ever been in touch with within our networks. Uh, like we, we would never have access to this individual. And so we were able to connect to them because we were in touch with the leadership team at GoFundMe. And the reason we were able to meet the leadership team at GoFundMe was because of an individual named uh, Rob, who was a CEO of another crowdfunding company called CrowdRise. And he had put us in touch with them. And the reason why we were able to even be in touch with him is because he reached out to us because of our Jewish cemeteries campaign. And he felt that, uh, you know, he was really touched by that as someone who identifies as Jewish. And so because of that one campaign where we had said, you know what, let's do something, let's, let's show our support as a Muslim community. Uh, it's really that symbolism and that emotional message of support. Because of that campaign, it led to so many other connections down the line that helped us solve a specific issue and a problem we had. And it was, you know, it, it really unfolded in such an amazing way. And we keep seeing this within campaigns we've helped where someone that we've worked with on a specific campaign or effort later ends up being a relief or a support for us uh, for something that we needed, that we didn't think that uh, we would have support with. And I think that's just been a beautiful kind of a cycle of good, uh, whether it's the donors that come up and say, hey, you know what, uh, I know someone that could help you with this, or it's the campaign organizers doing incredible work that end up connecting with each other and saying, you know what, we've done this here in our community, let's show you how we do it so that you don't have to spend the time and energy to have to rebuild from scratch. Uh, so it, it's a specific situation that I think that that's been incredible. The other half story I'll share is there's a specific mosque in Michigan, which I'm originally from, uh, that led a masjid fundraiser. And they did such an incredible job with this message fundraiser considering COVID. Uh, and they did it all through WhatsApp, which I thought was incredible. I mean, they raised $150,000 in about seven days. And uh, when I asked them how they did it, they said it was a power of prayer. Like we, we had this really strong intentionality of like, we're going to take this effort on and we're going to help build this mosque. And then two, uh, they just went very crazy with WhatsApp. I mean, this was technically an older community, not young, uh, but they utilized a WhatsApp network and uh, really, really did an incredible job. And it was a reminder for me that uh, like all the work you do, that intentionality is so important, right? That the ability to say, you know what, um, why am I doing this and why it's so important? Uh, and, and then seeing how that ends up uh, taking part in this amazing cycle of good that, that later you, you just get to kind of reap the benefits of. SubhanAllah. Those are both amazing stories. Wow. Um, that, that's great. Alhamdulillah. Uh, we did have one brother that asked a question a little bit earlier and I missed it. Um, and then and Amani is targeted towards you a little bit. Um, uh, he, he, he really wants to use Launch Good, and he has a restaurant in Los Angeles and wants to have 3,000 meals a day uh, and have those distributed in the city. Um, and he's wondering how Launch Good could help out, how, how, how that platform could help out with his business. Yeah, you know, he can just go to launchgood.com slash consult, and he can talk to anyone from our team. Um, again, we're here for the community now, considering what's happening with COVID uh, and wanting to make sure that you have real-time support, so he can just go to launchkit.com slash consult and talk to anyone from our team, inshallah, especially our North American team, to see if this is a good fit, what else he might need, and any other case examples or studies that 
uh, he could use uh, to help make his campaign more successful. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Amani, for the amazing discussion tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. As Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. Um, if you would like to share this webinar, it will be uploaded on the MCC Interfaith and Outreach Facebook page uh, and the MEC Masjid YouTube channel as well. Uh, this information will also be posted on the MCC website and many platforms for you to review at your leisure. Um, after every webinar, we have a poll, a different poll. Uh, please fill out the poll for tonight's lecture to help us get feedback for our series and we continue to have them going well in the future, inshallah. Um, also, feel free to donate using the link in the chat. Uh, I know Anjum has been sending the link in the chat, so make sure you guys donate if you guys can, now or in the future. Uh, and thank you in advance for your uh, generosity. Don't forget to jump on the Zoom again on Saturday at 6 p.m. Central Time for our next topic, Essential, essential Skills for Time Management with MCC's Imam, uh, Imam Ibrahim. Um, and again, thank you guys so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Inshallah, you guys all stay safe, stay healthy, and assalamu alaikum. Wow,